I'm Steve Russell. I'm a photojournalist at the Toronto Star, and I strive to make sure all my images tell the truth. I discovered photojournalism, or maybe it discovered me, when my family moved to South America when I was 10 years old. We moved to Peru, it was under martial law at the time, and they were only allowing three English language publications into the country. Time Magazine, Newsweek, and National Geographic, and no, that's not a picture of me holding a camera in the middle. <laughs> and we lived there for a few years, then I returned to Canada to continue my education. It was in university where I was kind of trying to find my way. I was studying, I changed majors four times, bio, uh, sciences, biochemistry, uh, anthropology, modern languages. And while I was struggling to find my way through university, I picked up a camera and started taking pictures for the student newspaper. And for me, I was hooked. I discovered that Loyalist College in Belleville, Ontario had a photojournalism program, one of only two in the country, and I went. And I, like, I walked in there with Bambi eyes. Everything was new, everything was exciting, everything was so challenging. And, you know, we talked about ethics a little bit in class, but most of it was talking about, you know, how to treat a subject in a photo shoot. We didn't really talk about the dark side of uh, photojournalism. And now, like, I've been working at the Star as a working photojournalist for 22 years, and I've, I've learned how much of a powerful tool photojournalism is. I've traveled the world. I've covered conflict. I've covered Olympics, people's I've victories, covered. and people's challenges. And people have let me in to share intimate moments in their life. And through stories and storytelling, my pictures have helped change laws in the province and in the country. I always worry about, throughout my, my journey in photojournalism, and as I evolved as a photographer, I started seeing a little bit more of the dark side of photojournalism. Can we say that every photographer, every picture is real? Right off the start, you're at the mercy of my eye. My choice of lens, my choice of how I position myself in a room, my choice of how I'm gonna tell the story, play a role in it. If we go and look at the first picture that's considered photojournalism, this photo of a Paris street, it's uh, Boulevard du Temple in, uh, it was a super popular street. It was lined with movie theaters. Very busy. Is this a true representation? It was shot by uh, Louis Daguerre in 1838. Now, is this a true representation of that street? Well, it's a photo of the street, but is it a true representation? No. Where are the people? It's one of the busiest streets in Paris at that time. But. Because of the camera he was using, he was limited by its capabilities. To record this image, it was a 10-minute exposure. In that 10 minutes, the, all the carts on that street, all the carriages are ghosted out because they're moving through the frame. All the people along the boulevard are ghosted out because they're not stopped in one place long enough to be recorded. And there actually is a an accident in there which makes this people consider this the first candid photo of people ever and on that street in the bottom corner you can see the only two people recorded there's a man and a shoe shine who were in one spot long enough to be recorded so we're starting to see a little bit of the limitations of what like equipment bring us the next limitations, or the next manipulations of photos, are enhancements. We took the photo, we have to publish it. What do we do? Back then, and even now, pictures are manipulated a little bit for publication. Dark areas are lightened up a little bit, so that when you read the paper, the ink doesn't clog that area and you don't finish having black hands when you finish reading that paper. So, 
And what happened is most papers have people at the paper that can deal, that enhance those photos. And what happened is as time went on, they discovered like one of these darkroom techs had some artistic abilities. So they could start using that to enhance photos for publications. And here's where we start going down a little strip. We go, we go like, okay, we're, we're, we're going to enhance this photo so we can publish it. You know, we're going to clean up a dark area, we're going to clean up a white area. But then, once you start doing that, you start going down that slide. And so this is a photo of Adele Mara, who is a 1940s actor and pinup. And we're also talking the 1940s. It, it wasn't like we are today, where you can go and you can get on the Google and you can look for a photo and you can get millions of, millions of different versions of a photo. Back then, like most photographers, would might take about 12 photos a day. I have cameras where I can take 12 photos a second. So they might have been a little bit limited about what they could do with a photo. They might have only had one photo of Adele that they were going to publish. But an editor deemed the photo that they had inappropriate, and they said, we need to do something different with her. But this is the only photo we have. So they gave it to that darkroom tech. And this is Photoshop before there was Photoshop. This is a guy with like some paint and some whiteout. <laughs> There's the original photo. So if the photo doesn't deal with her as a pinup star, and you're doing something about her acting career, maybe the photo of her on the diving board in the bikini doesn't, doesn't apply. But then sometimes editors start using this as a crutch. This is a photo taken in Toronto on Sackville Street in 1968 by uh, Boris Primo. The photo was to run with a story about, this is Regent Park area before Regent Park got built, I think. And uh, it was a story about, running, uh, about rundown housing by absentee landlords and how people were living in condemned buildings. A couple years later, they start doing some stories on how, about poverty in Toronto. They want to use this photo, but an editor goes, well, hang on a second. The boy is dark-skinned. Do we want to stereotype a community by saying that they live in poverty? So they came up with a compromise, and then they took this picture, and they changed it to this. And this is the, the thing starting to slide down even further. And at this time, you had m maybe each newspaper or magazine had one or two people in their darkroom that could do this kind of work. You know, you have to have that artistic flair. But nowadays, with the advent of Photoshop, we all carry around things that we can do that stuff with. Like, everybody's got the power to mess with a picture now. It used to be like one person could do it. Now everybody can do it. And for me as a photojournalist, that's, that's dangerous to me. Like, I take my, cra my, uh, my craft, I deal in truths. I, I go out and I try to photograph as close to the truth as I can, you know, notwithstanding my eye and how I position myself and the lens choice. So when, when I see these things, it upsets me, even in, even in my own archive. Now, it happened very rarely, but we always see those instances where it happens. And for me, if people don't believe what I sh photographed is the truth, then, you know, where's photojournalism? Where's journalism as, as a whole? And with Photoshop, it still happens. But as photographers, we police each other. Like, when, I, when I'm at an event and I see a colleague from the National Post, the Globe and Mail, or the Toronto Sun there, I'll look at what they shot the next day. And if I think they did something a little offline, off I might call them up and say, hey, how'd you get that shot? Because I was there and the light wasn't doing that. And they'll do the same to me. And most of the people that get busted are busted by other photographers nowadays. Like, you know, here's, here's, a, here's a great example. This is a picture of President Trump. The photo back graph on the left 
was photographed by a White House photographer, so one of his own photographers, and it was posted on the White House Flickr. Then, someone from the White House Facebook page used it to make a meme for their Facebook page. And so if we look at the picture, like, you know, the first thing, you know, like, look, the meme had him popping out of the top of the meme, so that's why there's white there. But, you know, they made him a little bit paler. But, you know, what's President Trump's big thing that everybody makes fun of? His hand size, right? <laughs> so if you look, the picture on the right, his finger's super long compared to the one on the left. <laughs> like, it's crazy. <laughs> so what we see here is, like, these kinds of things, you're altering reality, and, and for the most part, this is pretty obvious. And this isn't the part of photojournalism that, that scares me, because we can police this. But, you know, the big thing that's changing now is context, how people are using pictures. Uh, there's an erosion of truth and fact in our world now when you're on social media. You know, people are using photos to misrepresent events, and that totally fuels fake news. A thing like a, the Cleveland Cavaliers victory parade after they won the NBA championships a couple years ago has been used constantly in images depicting crowd sizes at Trump rallies in Phoenix, Portland, Maine, and Jacksonville. It's, it's crazy. They're taking these photos and they're using them totally out of context. Entirely out of context. It's a real photo. You, there's nothing been manipulated in the photo, but everything surrounding the photo is fake. Here we have three pictures. The w big one is a Palestinian uh, uh, riot in the 1980s. The other one is the Greek austerity uh, riots that happened in this decade. And the last one is an anti-Trump rally in the southern US. All these pictures have been used to paint a disparaging look at the migrant caravans that are making their way towards the American border and saying that they're all migrants. And why does this happen? No, nobody really checks the image. When, you know, it's hard to say that journalists are all 100% unbiased. Like, I'm a journalist and I have biases. But my training as a photojournalist and as a journalist has me, forces me to look at both sides of a story. If I'm covering an event, I will make sure that I stand with one side and talk to people and photograph from their perspective. I'll go to the other side of the fence and I'll photograph from that perspective. And then I'll stand in the middle and I'll make sure that I cover both ends of that. I try to approach it as if I'm any one of you walking into that scene. What, what do you see and how does it work? And I carry that responsibility when I get back to the newspaper. I'll sit there with an editor and the reporter and we'll talk about which images to use with the story. Sometimes my images might be different from what the story is, but it's bringing another perspective. It's using the, the, story, the, the photo as the thousand words to tell you a different story. So, you know, a reporter will be at, I might go to an event and shoot 2,000 images and get back to the paper and maybe file 10. Does it cover the whole event? No, because I've already kind of like isolated those 10 instances where I'm going to use the photo. But it's no different than a reporter going and interviewing somebody at the parade or interviewing several people and then only using four or five relevant quotes. They're editing it down. And it's no different than when you guys go to an event in your lives and at the end of the day you sit there and you decide to share some images. You edit that down to three or four pictures, you know, you might put an Instagram up, you might put up a couple on Twitter, or like maybe a few more on Facebook. So you're doing that editing that I'm doing too. So what do we want to take from this? 
when, what, what scares me about all this in photojournalism is how these pictures are being used now. And, you know, I have this platform now, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you guys for help. When, when, when you guys see these memes, when you open up your Twitter, your Instagram, your Facebook, and any other social platform that you might be on, and you see these memes and pictures, think, of, think a little bit about what your, you know, as your mouse hovers over the like, share, comment, repost, retweet buttons. Think about what exactly you're going to share. Take that one second and go, is that real? You can always grab that image and reverse Google search the image, see if the image has been used before. And just fact check it for me. And that would make me as a photojournalist really love my craft and not worry about its future. Thank you.